Yep, I did. Forget. Ah, okay. Okay. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Here we see that the third member of the Godhead who possesses wisdom will anoint the second member of the Godhead and bestow wisdom upon his humble human state. Isaiah 55, verse 9, God says, mm -hmm. My uh, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can never fully understand the wisdom of God except those portions which he has revealed to us. In Romans 11, 33, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. It is so deep we can never plumb the depths of the inscrutable wisdom of God. Romans 11, 27, God is called the only wise God. There is only one who is wise, and that is God. Colossians 2, verse 3 says of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. They're all in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, if a person does not know Christ, they do not have one drop of wisdom at all. They're just clever fools. How we need the Lord Jesus Christ and his wisdom. Now, in this session, I want to have two main headings. The definition of wisdom and then the displays of wisdom. Let's consider first the definition of wisdom. And what is wisdom? wisdom. Well, God is all wise, and that means that his choices always pursue the highest end. When we say the highest end, we mean the greatest good, the highest purpose. Wisdom always chooses the highest end, but second, along with that, the best means by which to arrive at the highest in uh, these highest goals or the highest in is always the glory of God and the good of his people. And they are never at conflict. Um, God is doing all things to promote his own glory. He is so wise. Romans 11, 36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God is passionate about his own glory. God is purposeful to magnify his name and his own glory above all. And that is what God is about in the world, setting forth his own glory. Romans 16, 27. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Wisdom and glory are often related. Because the highest end of wisdom is the glory of God. Would you make wise choices in your life? The wisest choice is always what will most glorify God. What will most magnify him? That is always the fundamental issue in decision making in the Christian life. Especially in those areas where there's not a verse that directly speaks to what is before us. We should say, what will most glorify and honor God? And when God is most glorified, he also brings greatest good to his people. So, what is the wisdom of God? It is that God always chooses the highest end and the best means to attain that highest end. That is his wisdom. Now, where is this wisdom seen? I said the dimensions of wisdom, really the display of wisdom. There are three main categories now that I want you to think about on the display of God's wisdom, where we see God's wisdom clearly evident. 
And the first would be his wisdom in creation. Think about the wisdom of God in creating this world. Uh, the sheer genius of God put on display in this world as God has created everything in this world. It is the highest end and the best means towards that. That highest end is the glory of God. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare what? The glory of God. God's wisdom in creation is the pursuit and the magnification of his own glory, that his greatness would be seen, his, his grandeur would be put on display in the works of his hands. John Calvin has said the entire universe is a theater to showcase the glory of God. And Romans 1, verse 20 says, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So God's highest end is to showcase his greatness and his grandeur. Now, he's chosen the best means to that end. One, by the way with which God has created, he has chosen to create not by a big bang in outer space, not by a, a, a pulsating universe. What would bring greatest glory to God in the way by which he would bring about creation? What would most showcase his power and his awesomeness and his wisdom? It would be simply for God to say, let there be light and there would be light. And on six consecutive days, God, with perfect order and design, with inscrutable wisdom, for God to immediately and instantaneously create everything out of nothing. Oh, that brings greatest glory to God, and it is the wisdom of God that it has been done this way. Think about as God has made creation, his wisdom that is seen. Just take the globe on which you and I live, planet Earth. How? It is tilted at just the right angle that it would rotate and spin at just the right speed, that it would be in an orbit in its path around the sun just right, that it would have just the right distance to the sun. If we were any closer, we would burn up. If we were any further away, we would freeze to death. Now God has balanced out the heights of the mountains and the depths of the ocean so that as the earth is spinning, it spins not like a, a, a ball, a beach ball that is out of center and wobbles off to the side, but it spins with perfect balance and precision. Think of the wisdom of God, how he just hangs the earth in space. They used to think well, it was on the back of Atlas or on the back of an elephant or something like that. But the sheer genius and the wisdom of God is so clearly seen in the way with which he has made this world. The beauty, the diversity uh, in the animal kingdom, in the regions, in the weather. Think of the wisdom of God. Only God could have established this. Read the end of the book of Job. Listen to God say to Job, where were you when we created the world together? I can't seem to remember where you were. As, as Job was calling into account God's management of his life. You know, the God of perfect wisdom to manage our lives is the same God with perfect wisdom that has made the world as it is. And he goes on to say how God established the shoreline just at the exact place, the beach, the meeting of the land and the ocean, exactly as God has laid it out. How in God's perfect wisdom, how God can, can make, as it were, almost a refrigerator up in midair, and the snow and the ice just come falling down out of thin air. How the rivers continue to flow into the ocean, and then God pulls it up with evaporation into a cloud, and God just blows on that cloud. The wind takes it back over the land, and it builds up and builds up with its uh, humidity until finally it just drops that water back down onto the 
dry land and then it flows back down into creeks and into streams and into rivers and empties back into the ocean. How about the wisdom and the genius of God, the changing of the seasons, the harvest, the planting of the seeds, the wisdom of God in creation. Second, the wisdom of God in providence. How God is with the affairs of providence. He has the highest end in mind, his glory. And he chooses the best path for us to providentially be ushered along by in order to reach that highest end. Um, all God's choices are, are made with perfect wisdom. It's tiny and perfect in our lives. Uh, think about the wisdom of God, the time in history when he had you born, uh, the place on the map where you were born, who your parents would be, what would be that passing down of a genetic structure and, and, and influences that would be inbred in you, uh, the regions that you grew up, the, the people around you, the teachers, the friends, uh, all of this under the, the wisdom of God's design um, and for the greatest purpose, to bring about his own glory, such that whether we eat or drink, we would do all for the glory of God. This is all according to the perfect wisdom of God. Even the trials in our life come under the scrutiny of his sovereignty and have the the perfect wisdom of God, knowing exactly what would be needed in our lives at times to humble us, to, to prune us, to, to deepen our faith, to nurture us, to develop us, to wean us off of the world, to draw us closer to himself, to conform us more into the image of Christ. God, with perfect wisdom, using even uh, not only trials and adversities, but, but even Satan and his demons to be used, uh, even using evil for a good purpose in our lives to bring about the greatest good, which would be to conform us into the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of Genesis 50 and verse 20 at the end of Joseph's life. Think about all that Joseph went through, sold into slavery by his brothers, taken down to Egypt, abandoned, forsaken, um, working his way up, uh, Potiphar's wife making advances, his running away, being suffering unjustly, being thrown into prison, being released, working his way up to the top. All of that adversity, all of that difficulty, and yet at the end, we read, they meant it for evil. God meant it for good. God is so wise that he can even draw a straight line with a crooked stick. God can use even evil and adversity and trials to bring about the greatest good in our lives. Look at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was crucified according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. That was God's design. That was God's purpose. Yet, it was the first degree premeditated murder of the second member of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It was the greatest evil that has ever occurred on planet Earth. God had only one son. He was a perfect son and sent him into the world that he might seek and save that which is lost. And this world rose up in an evil conspiracy and called for his crucifixion and nailed him to a cross. It was blasphemous. It was sinful. And yet it was the eternal sovereign counsel of God to bring about this perfect plan of salvation. How wise is God to be able, as Romans 8, verse 28 says, to cause all things to work together for good. And these lines intersect far above our heads, that they
may nevertheless bring great comfort to our hearts to know that nothing just happens, that everything is according to a master plan and purpose that God has for our lives. The wisdom of God in providence. Even the mere fact that he has brought us together for this class today, as we have come from all different backgrounds. We, we have people here, even from across the Atlantic Ocean, and people have come from across the Gulf of Mexico. We have people here in this room from different continents. And as we come together, nevertheless, in God's wisdom, there is a great purpose and a great plan for our being here. And it is the glorification of his name through the teaching of his attributes, but also for the good of his people, that we would be built up and encouraged. How good our God is to be working such wise and perfect paths in our lives. But the greatest area of wisdom is not in creation and not even in providence, as extraordinary as that is, the greatest display of divine wisdom that this world has ever seen or ever will see is in salvation. Is in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not simply in the providence by which Jesus was crucified, of which I just spoke a minute ago, but in the power of that cross to save sinners. Only God could have designed the plan of salvation. If we were to meet in this room for the next 10,000 years, we could never come up with a more brilliant, stunning, yet simple, yet profound plan of salvation that that God the Father would commission the second person of the Godhead, the eternal Son of the living God, to be born of a virgin? What kind of wisdom is this? That he would enter the human race yet without a sin nature? That he would be in his mother's womb for nine months? He would be born under the law, the very law that you and I break again and again and again and find ourselves under the curse of that law. He himself, born under that law, yet has obeyed it perfectly throughout the entirety of his life, that he might give to all who believe in him his perfect active obedience to be imputed to our account as though we ourselves have lived perfectly under the law for the entirety of our lives, that his righteousness and his obedience would be imputed to us as though we have lived in perfect obedience to this law. Yet what is more, that he would be condemned before Pilate, he would be sentenced to death upon a cross, that cross being the most shameful, horrific death that anyone could ever suffer, that he would go to that cross, the Prince of Life, the Lord Jesus Christ. He would be lifted up upon that cross, and him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us. What genius of God, what wisdom of God, that all of our sins who believe upon Christ would be transferred to him and that he would bear our sins in his body upon that tree, that he would become a curse for us upon that cross, that he would shed his blood, and in the shedding of that blood, wash away all of our sins to be our scapegoat, our sins laid upon him, and he would be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And upon that cross, having paid in full, the sin debt of all those for whom he died, he would cry out, it is finished, paid in full. He would be taken down off of that cross, placed in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day, God would raise him from the dead. He would walk out of that tomb, a risen, living, victorious Savior, 
40 days later, he would ascend back to heaven, be enthroned at the right hand of God the Father, all authority in heaven and earth given unto him, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What an extraordinary, wise plan of salvation that God has designed. That he could be both the just and the justifier. That my sins would be paid for by an innocent substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ. He would suffer in my place. He would bear my sin. He would suffer the wrath of God to me. It would fall upon his blessed head. He would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That I might have intimate, personal fellowship and communion with this holy God. Now, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time. What genius. What a wise plan of salvation. No man could have ever conceived this plan of salvation. No denomination could have ever come up with this. No, this is the wisdom of the ages. This is the wisdom of heaven that God has provided an innocent substitute to die in our place upon Calvary's cross. No wonder we read in 1 Corinthians 1 that we preach Christ crucified, foolishness to the Greeks, but it is the power and the wisdom of God unto us. This is the wisdom of God supremely put on display in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Okay, having heard the presentation, it's time to answer questions. <clears throat> Even works of evil and hatred are part of God's wise plan. True or false? True. Thank you. Question two. God's wisdom is best described as A, his knowledge of everything, B, the purity of his thoughts, C, his choice of the highest end and the best means to that end, or D, the quality of his knowledge that distinguishes his thoughts from man's thoughts. C is correct, thank you. Number three, because God is ultimately wise, all of the following are true except one of them. A, the history of the world will lead to his glory. B, his wise choices will always be comprehensible to his people. C, studying the natural world reveals his wisdom, or D, his providential choices will always have their desired end. B, correct. God's wisdom is best displayed in the works of nature. True or false? False, correct. Displayed there, but not the most notable. Okay, notable quotations, two of them. We must suffer God to be wiser than ourselves. Should be easy enough, but sometimes we argue with God. And, and acknowledge that there is uh, something sovereign in his ways not to be measured by the feeble read of our weak understandings. Uh, not a very common expression for us. Uh, it was made by Stephen Charnock some time ago. But you can understand that, the feebleness of our brains and our understanding. And number two... The wisdom of God in the work of redemption is of vast extent. The contrivance is, a, is so manifold that one may spend an eternity in discovering more of the excellent ends and designs accomplished by it, and the multitude and vast variety of things that are, by divine contrivance, brought to conspire to the, to the bringing about of those ends, from none other than Jonathan Edwards. Okay, 
Time for some discussion questions. This is where you really get to participate. Number one, how, oops, how can meditating on God's wisdom help you or someone you know to be comforted when reflecting on the difficulties of life, both past and present? Thoughts? Anyone? No one's ever been comforted? Come on now. Good. Anybody else want to share? So it's always easy to get stuck with present, you know, difficulties, right? In our, in our right, you know, front and center in our lives, but you know, we don't reflect on the past with our sense of like, you know, you know, we lose sight of, you know, everything we've done today. Yeah, that's a huge comfort for us. You're like, wait, I've done all this for you before, and this is just, you know, the same. The word remember occurs throughout the scriptures. And as we read the scriptures, we can see how God has acted in the past. We can see that he's made promises about his always going to be with us. He will not fail us or forsake us. And that as he helped people in the past, he too will be helping us. Yes, good point. Also going on, uh, I'm not sure what Jesus said about how, I think just maybe contrasting the way we often try to comfort people is uh, we try to help them not to see, you know, how bad things are, but maybe that they're actually really good. Like, I feel like that's the, kind of the, the way that the world has helped comfort each other. <clears throat> but, like, when you look at Job at the end of his life and all the struggles that he's been through, God didn't encourage him by saying, hey, Joe, you're actually a really good guy. You know, uh, I'm glad to have you around. He just, like, Maybe put him in a place that Job actually just covered his mouth. Like he was so impressed at who God was that his own circumstances, as awful as they were, were put in perspective. Like his eyes were off of himself and on God. I see that very well. Like it's always been yeah. around him. Good, good. Anybody else before we go on to the next question? Are there times in your life when it feels like God did not choose the best means to accomplish his, his uh, goal of a glorifying end? How can considering the wisdom of the cross, which is foolishness to the world, bring clarity and renewed trust in his plan? So first of all, you know, have you ever felt like, God, how can this possibly be the right and best thing? I'm sure you've all felt that way. Who wants to share? Eric. I mean, I, I don't know if, if this is true for other people, but I've definitely had moments like that where I know the truth, but I, I sort of don't want to. I'm kind of stubborn in my being upset mm -hmm. or uh, sometimes maybe selfishness or just maybe something I felt like I was owed or, or a circumstance that I felt like I was convinced there was a better way. So usually, you know, depending on how long, at some point, I'll just be humble to, to accept like the, the greatest good. Like mm -hmm. in this, like if you, if you finally humble yourself to salvation and see God's love in that, it pretty much Kind of makes everything else seem a little bit, I guess, pointless. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but it takes a, sometimes it can take a while to like at least on a personal level mm -hmm. like yeah. truth or what yeah good who else We can look at the Psalms, and there are a number of Psalms where the psalmist is crying out, God, don't you, don't you see what's going on? Uh, God, are, are you there? Or, or in the case of Habakkuk, when, uh, when God told him that he was going to raise up a very wicked nation to come and punish his nation, uh, Habakkuk was just dumbfounded. How, how can you possibly do that? And God spoke to him further and finally he got it and said okay though my knees are trembling and shaking and i can hardly stand i will uh, i will i will trust in you no matter if all the cattle are gone and all the sheep are gone and all the olive trees and the, the, the grapevines are gone you know you're in charge and you you know what you're doing even though i can't fathom it um, and that's how it that, that's what it comes down to we in our small understanding, cannot fathom what God is doing, how he's orchestrating through various means. Uh, and as we look at the world today, we can go, God, how can you possibly allow this and that and this and that and these, all these different areas? What are you thinking? But he knows what he's doing, and it's beyond our ability to understand. And so we have to rest in the knowledge that, A, he's perfect, that his wisdom is perfect, that his providence is perfect, his power and knowledge are perfect, and that he indeed is bringing about the highest ends, even though we may not get a glimpse of why certain things happen in our lives or the lives of other people around us. We can rest in that. Yes, Kathy. And then Tan, I think. I think also put Eric said, did you call me? I'm sorry. Yes, I did. Okay. I said Kathy, and then I think Tan wanted to say something. Okay. On what Eric said, and also what this is asking about here, I just think of the painful things that he's taken me through, often because of my sin, and how I'm not able, or I choose not to see it until he humbles me and helps me to see it. And I think of that along with uh, in Romans 8, it says, He who did not withhold his own son, but he delivered us from it. But delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with him give us all things? And you know, it says the wisdom of the cross, and mm -hmm. how he gave us the one who he loved the most. How will he not also with that also give us everything that's perfect? Because he loves us so deeply, mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel like it at the time when I'm in the midst of my sin, but then he's. He's purifying, he's, he's doing his work to bring glory to himself and ultimately by his grace to bring it to me, which there's no other. Yeah. Resting and relying upon him are not easy, but they're essential. And we need to encourage one another to do that. And we have to keep encouraging one another to do that over and over and reminding one another that great is his faithfulness, perfect is his faithfulness, and perfect is his covenant love. Um, and then finally, and we're kind of out of time, but how should your everyday decisions be affected by a consideration of God's wisdom and the final goal to which his wisdom is directed? Someone? Anyone? Well, he mentioned thinking about what's going to glorify God. <clears throat> I think that was really helpful for me just to kind of put it in perspective because I do think sometimes we we look at all the benefits but we sort of use if we really think about it we're kind of like um, trying to make it look like it's for God's glory but it's really the, the one that benefits us the most mm -hmm. right like it's sort of like you're nice to somebody kind of but but there's a little kickback you might get whereas this tries to take that away Yeah, what will most glorify God should be the question we ask ourselves again and again and again. Any final thoughts or questions? Okay.
Let's pray. All wise God, we come into your presence. We have that privilege because of the greatest display of wisdom that you have ever made manifest. The birth, life, death, and resurrection and ascension of your beloved son, that he might obtain a people for his own possession and adopt those who believe into your eternal heavenly family. Such grace, such mercy, such wisdom is beyond our ability to fathom. We pray that we would fall down in reverence and awe before you, overcome by your wisdom and all your perfections, all your glory, and that we would worship you aright in spirit and in truth and be continually seeking to rely upon and rest in you, be guided by you, be forgiven by you, be filled with your spirit and transformed and conformed by the working of that spirit so that we can indeed uh, choose what will most glorify you and the things we think, speak, and do. That we would desire to do the good works that you have set before us to do from, all, from time to eternity, the things that will most glorify you. Help us to earnestly seek you and to seek to know what those things are and to do them in the dynamite power that the Holy Spirit provides us and help us to encourage and comfort one another, pointing one another to you and to these truths and to your greatness and to the fact that you are indeed working all things according to the counsel of your will and you cannot be thwarted. We thank you for that knowledge. We thank you that we have the opportunity to meet in freedom at, at this time and to worship you. Help us to do so robustly today with ears and eyes and hearts and minds wide open to you. And may your spirit work within us. We pray all these things in the magnificent name of Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed. Dr. Van Drunen will be here next Sunday. And this time I'll get to be here to hear him. I am going to quickly run through the slides that didn't get recorded at the beginning. There are the, some key points. This is for those who see this later. Some key points. Questions to answer, which you got to see. Here's the message introduction. You can pause these if you're looking at it afterwards, see it. Here are some key scriptures and more and more teaching objectives. And that's it. Actually, hold on. Whoops. Yep, that's it. All right, I'm going to stop sharing now. And I am going to bid you all adieu and hope that you have a continued blessed Lord's Day. God bless you. We miss you.